welcome to the case study on pressure sink mitigation. And in this case study, I'll be talking about the effect of preloading parent wells to better control infill hydraulic fracture propagation. So in this case study, we're going to be testing different strategies to avoid the frac hits between the parent and the child wells. So first, let's start with the definition of the term frac hit. Frac hits are caused by pressure sinks which occur around parent wells. So once you deplete a parent well for a period of time and then frack the child well, the child well fractures will grow towards areas where there's a higher chance of shear failure. And of course this is going to be near existing parent wells that have already been depleted and this can cause a loss of production in both the parent and the child well. And as you can see with these images, the number of child wells is increasing significantly, especially in the Eagle Ford. The number of child wells have actually overtaken the number of parent wells being drilled. And then similarly in the Montney, you have a 100% increase from the early 2000s to 2017, 2018 um, in terms of the child wells that are being uh, drilled. So our goal here is to prevent these frac hits between the parent and child wells in order to optimize production from all the wells. So. The understanding frac hits is important because it can often lead to reduced production potential for both the parent and the child wells. So for example, in this case, um, this well, uh, for the parent wells, there's two parent wells, they were drilled in 2014, and they had 29 fractures per well. And you can kind of see what the oil production was at 180 days. For the child wells that were drilled in 2019, you had 193 fractures per well, but you can see that the child well production is significantly lower than the parent well production. So the question is, how can we mitigate this? How can we ensure that the child well production is just as high or in the same range as the parent well production? So essentially, we have two choices. The first choice is to reduce the capital expenses uh, per well, the capex per well. Um, but we want to maximize the NPV. We want to... Um, uh, we want to increase the production as much as possible. And so in this case, we're going to actually take the upper work, upper path here. In this case, we're going to preload the parent wells. Um, and there are different techniques for doing this, but essentially by preloading these wells, we're going to try to create a stress barrier to reduce the potential of frac hits. And we're going to be talking about the different strategies for preloading these parent wells um, during this case study. Okay, so this is the simulation model that's been built. Um, and the, well, there's six wells completed in the Montney D formation. Wells P1, P2, and P3 are the parent wells, and then C1, C2, and C3 are the child wells. So you can see in this image where you have two child wells here in the upper zone, and then C1 in the lower zone, and then all three parent wells have been drilled in the lower zone as well. And this image gives an aerial view of all the wells. So when it comes to using a reservoir simulator to model the hydraulic fractures, there's different approaches that can be taken. Uh, the history match of just the parent well, uh, it follows the upper pathway where the fractures are present at the, mod uh, at the start of the simulation. So we're using the planar fractures approach. In this case, we don't need to model the injection, so we don't, we're just going to use the upper pathway for the parent wells. For the child well modeling, we're going to look at the impact of mitigation techniques, and because of this, we need to model the injection um, associated with the fracture creation as well. So with this, we're going to use the bottom uh, pathway, and there's different fidelity options. And this specific case study, we've chosen the low fidelity approach, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Okay, so since the primary objective of this project is to look at the influence of how child well fractures will grow, we need to model the injection as I talked about on the previous slide. So in this case, we've used the low fidelity technique and the way it works is we have a pressure versus transmissibility relationship. So once you start doing an injection, let's say you're at 4,000 PSI, once you reach the dilation pressure, there's going to be a rapid increase in the transmissibility for a small change in pressure. And once the injection is done, you're going to have different unloading paths. So near the well, near the perforations where the injection, the pressure has increased the most, you're going to be above this point. So when the pressure comes down, you're going to follow this transmissibility path. So the transmissibility in those blocks will be retained for a higher period of time. If the pressure in the blocks a little bit further away were in between this green line and the red line, then when the pressure starts declining, it'll come down this green path and the transmissibility still will be retained more than if you know, there had been no stimulation done at all. And then lastly, if the, transmissibility, if the pressure did not reach this point, then the transmissibility will come down the blue line and then go on to the gray one. Okay, so that's how uh, we uh, use this low fidelity approach to realistically capture these fracture growth, uh, fracture creation. 
video on the screen here just shows the SRV creation for the two child wells, C2 and C3. So you can see that, you know, the fractures are not growing uniformly. There is a little bit of, uh, diff there's differences between the two. It's not like planar fractures. There's more SRVs type fractures. And the fracture growth is best based on the anistrophy of the properties along the length of the well. So this image shows the history match for one of the child wells, and it shows the history match for all of the stages. And the average injection rate during the stages was used as a constant, and this was history matched against the bottom hole pressure during the injection. So as you can see, the bottom hole pressure has been matched very closely uh, for all the stages for the specific well. All right, so now we're going to look at the three different preloading scenarios. Um, so we have three cases. Case one is the pressure support case, which is a low pressure injection. So with this one, we just increase the stress around the parent well to reduce the asymmetry. Um, and it, we just do the ejection at a lower pressure. Case two is a refracturing option, which is a high pressure injection. In this case, we do take the propin into account. So we're refracting these wells along and injecting the propin along with um, the, the injection fluid as well. Case three is defensive fractures, which are called uh, otherwise known as propitless refracts. So with this one, um, there's we're assuming that it's still being the injection is being done at a high pressure, but we don't have any propit. That's what we're assuming in this specific case. So with this one, the arch the reason we would do something like this is the architecture makes propin based refracts challenging generally. So propin less fractures minimize the cost as we don't need to do a full frac spread on the on this location. So we're going to test three different techniques and see what type of impact they have um, in terms of the parent and the child of production once we apply the preloading scenarios. Okay, so this video just shows the impact, the increase in pressure after the injection is done. So you can see um, in the areas right around the perforations, it's increasing as much as 30,000 kPa after the injection is complete. And of course, this is going to have a big impact on the stress around the parent wells, as we'll see in the next slide. Okay, so as you can see, there's an increase in the stress around the parent wells, and this is going to provide a barrier to prevent the child wells from uh, coming and hitting the parent wells. Okay, so that's the goal of this preloading, is to create these stress barriers to prevent when these child wells are drilled that the fractures doesn't directly extend um, into, the, into the parent well fractures. All right, so now we'll take a look at the effects of preloading on the parent well production. So we have three parent wells, P1, P2, and P3. P3 is used as a control well, so there's no um, injection or preloading applied to this well. It's only been applied to P1 and P2. So in the first parent well, the black line is the no preloading case. And the blue line is the pressure support case where we did the injection at low pressure. And as you can see, for both the P1 and the P2 well, the pressure support case has almost no positive impact on the production. Okay. Um, the second case we looked at uh, was the refracturing, uh, which is the, with the propin um, in, in the, where see we're, we're taking the propin into account. And as you can see with this one, you have the biggest impact on the parent well production. You have a much higher, big, much bigger spike in the oil and oil production. The last one is the defensive fractures, which are the propin less fractures. And this one, again, just like the pressure support case, there is a smaller benefit in this case. You do see the cumulative production go up, but it's not that significant at all for the parent well. So in this case, definitely uh, the refracturing option seems to have given the big, biggest uplift to the parent well production. This slide looks at the child well production and the impact of the preloading on the child wells. So again, just like the previous case, the black line is the no preloading scenario, and the pressure support case has almost no impact um, on the child well production as well. But in terms of the refracturing and the defensive fractures of the propin and the propin less fracturing approach, they both have a very similar impact on the child well production. Um, so we definitely see an uplift in the oil production when we apply, in the child wells, I should say, uh, when these two techniques have been applied. So when we look at all, um, all the total production from both the parent and the child wells, uh, the trend becomes a little bit more clear. Um, so the refracking provides the highest increase in the oil production, followed by the propitless uh, refracts. The problem support case has no tangible impact on the production, so definitely it's not going to be very economical. Um, there's no real reason to be applying it based on the results of this case study. So we looked at quite a bit of quite a uh, quite a few different preloading scenarios. So let's just quickly compare the results in a table format. 
So in the refract, um, there is, uh, for, for the three-month case, we see a positive uplift in both the parent well and the child wells. With only two months of injection, we see the same trend, but a smaller order of magnitude. In one month, the results are worse. The pressure support case behaves very similar to the one-month injection, and it's possible that a longer injection period could have had a more positive results, like the refract case, but um, this would, of course, require a longer uh, injection period. And the defensive fractures have a similar impact on the child production uh, as, the, as the refract case, but a worse impact um, on the parent well production. So these are some of the conclusions from this case study. First of all, preloading does result in a production uplift, uh, and the refracturing demonstrated the largest uplift in the parent and the child wells. Challenging economics due to high cost and deferred production are definitely an issue here. You definitely you need to inject a lot of water volumes just to see a 10% uplift. So um, it might not be economical to apply this uh, for the specific reservoir. The pressure support case led to minimal production uplift. Um, so definitely this is the low pressure injection was not uh, the, the best approach uh, from the ones we compared. And lastly, modeling was critical in the implementation decision. So we avoid the pump and pray approach uh, where you just do it in the field and hope for the best. Doing the simulation enables a more precise and fit for purpose approach uh, that you can, you can kind of test before applying it uh, in, in real life. That brings me to the end of the case study. Uh, thank you for watching.